Hi, my name is Chris Potts, and I will be the food scientist guiding you through this applied food science course. So, just to clear up a few things to start, this week there will be no lab. However, in future weeks, you will need to complete lecture notes based on this video, which you will need to submit, and a lab each week, which you will need to take pictures of and document, provide results, we'll tell you exactly what you need to do. Now with that out of the way, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the universe. Now, we're cooking food in the universe, and that means that the food, as well as our entire world, obeys a few very fundamental rules and a few fundamental laws. Now if we want to look at food, we should break down food to what it is at its very core. And food, just like everything in the universe, is made up of a fundamental building block called atoms. Now, atoms are very much like this Lego in that, well, they're very simple. They're only made of a few little things, and they come in a lot of different varieties. Also, they can combine with other atoms to make new structures. Now, if we want to talk about all this, we're going to need some terminology that we're all on the same page with. So, so let's start out with this. An atom is a single unit of the fundamental building blocks of life. A molecule encompasses everything that is a single unit, whether it is an atom or a combination of, of atoms that has bonded together. This whole thing is a molecule. This is also a molecule. You could even have multiple of the same. And it's not just one or two atoms bonded together. We could throw on a third. We could throw on a fourth and so on. In fact, there are molecules that are millions of atoms big. There are huge molecules that we will actually deal with in this course. But so we're all on the same page. Once again, to reiterate, atom is the single unit, or a molecule can be either an atom or a combination of atoms bonded together. So this atom, while it is the fundamental particle of the universe, we can actually still break it down a little further. It turns out that atoms are actually made of three things. First, we have protons. Now, protons are positively charged, what is called subatomic, meaning smaller than atoms, particle. Protons are usually paired up with neutrons. Now, neutrons have no charge to them. So they, they really don't have much of an interaction with protons, but we'll get to that in a second. And the last subatomic particle that we are going to worry about are the electrons. Now notice electrons are much smaller than protons and neutrons, and electrons are also negatively charged. Hmm. So when we're talking about the structure of an atom, the basic idea here is that in the nucleus, which is at the center of the atom, it is the core of the atom, we have these protons and neutrons. Well, why do we need neutrons at all? Well, let's think about this for a second. As atoms get larger, they accumulate more protons and more neutrons. Well, if we have two protons that are both in the nucleus, positive charges repel each other. So if we just crammed a whole bunch of protons in here, they'd be fighting with each other to get out of there. That's why we need neutrons. Neutrons act as kind of a neutral middleman that keep everything in the nucleus together which is great for us. For now, we won't worry about extra protons. What we will worry about is our nucleus, protons, neutrons. Now the electrons are not in the nucleus. They are flying around atoms. Now a common misconception, uh, usually perpetuated by Jimmy Neutron, excellent show, but a little off topic, is that electrons just orbit the nucleus like 
planets orbit the sun. This is not the case. Electrons actually uh, fly around anywhere they want, as long as they stay in kind of a, a general area around the nucleus. All right? So we've got our, our individual atom, right? It's got protons, neutrons, it's got electrons flying all around. So the question is, what, what happens when one atom interacts with another atom? They've both got these fly, electrons flying around. So what happens when this atom gets closer? Well, it turns out that the protons and the neutrons really have no bearing on what actually happens in what is referred to as a chemical reaction. That is to say, any time atoms break bonds or form bonds, that is a chemical reaction. What's going on is it is the electrons interacting with each other that determines what's going to happen in our atom. Now there are two ways that this can happen. These electrons can be flying around and one of two things can happen. First, one atom can steal the electrons from the other atom. This happens usually if there's way more protons in one atom than the other one. Although the reasons can vary, you don't need to know that. So let's say this uh, atom steals this electron. Ooh! Now this, ele this atom has many more negative charges. It is relatively negative. Now this atom has very few negative charges. That means it's more positive. And we know that positive charges are attracted to negative charges. So when this happens, one atom steals an electron from the other one. They form what is called an ionic bond. Okay, we can think about this in terms of our Legos again. An ionic bond, let's say we've got these two Legos, and let's say the little stubs on the end of this uh, Lego are positive charges, and let's say the indents on the inside of this one are negative charges. Okay, when an ionic bond forms, essentially the positive is attracted to the negative, and these two stick together. Now this is the most common type of bond that will be affecting when it comes to cooking, and the reason is, when it comes to breaking these bonds apart, it's not that hard. You can just if you put in enough energy, they snap apart very easily. All right, so, so what else can happen? Well, let's say we've got our two atoms again, electrons flying around. Sometimes they both want the electrons equally bad or very near equally. And so they decide to share them in between them. So now they both have more electrons, which makes them both very happy. However, they're sharing these electrons. So what does that mean for us practically? Well, a great way to think about this is with this atom and this atom. They come together and they share their electrons. This essentially locks these two atoms together, which is excellent for us if we want food compounds that stay together, that maintain their integrity, that don't get broken down very easily. Because covalent bonds are really the heavy hitters of the molecular world. They will stick together under extreme stress and even with inputs of huge amounts of energy. The main reason they will change is if some key other atom comes in and unlocks this bond. Now, we will be dealing with some of these interactions. However, they're much less frequent than ionic uh, bond changes and ionic conformation changes. So, we've talked about our bonds uh, and, and affecting them. Well, let, let's get a little bit more into, into the specifics of cooking. So, let's look over here at this delicious beverage. Now, in here we've got water, ice water, right? So, so what's so special about ice water? Well, it turns out that ice and this liquid water are both made of the same molecule, that is to say an oxygen covalently bonded to two hydrogens. Now the oxygen is locked to those two hydrogens. So no matter what we do to this water, the, uh, the water molecules will not change. You will not have very much of the 
hydrogens breaking away from the oxygen. They're basically locked together. So how is it that we get a change from water to ice? Now that brings us to energy. Now energy is extremely important in cooking as I'm sure you're aware and the most important type of energy hands down without a doubt when it comes to uh, cooking is heat. Now all heat is is heat is a measure of the movement of molecules. The more a molecule is moving, is shaking, is jiggling, the hotter it is, we say. So when we look at this, all right, we've got our ice. Now, the ice has a very low heat compared to the rest of uh, the world that we live in. Ice freezes at zero degrees Celsius. That's what makes it zero degrees Celsius. So we know the ice is, is at least zero degrees Celsius, if not lower. Now, all the other water molecules in this are liquid, meaning they are zero degrees Celsius or above. So what's, uh, how does this work? Well, this brings us to our second very important type of energy, and that is called bond energy. Bond energy is a measure of how well molecules stick together. Now, what can be confusing about this is we just talked about ionic and covalent bonds, and I told you water is a covalent bond, but clearly we're not breaking covalent bonds here. That's okay. Bond energy refers to all types of bonds. And when it comes to water, it turns out water is held together by what is called hydrogen bonds. Again, you don't need to know this specific. You just need to know that bond energy refers to any and all types of bonds and the energy of holding them together. So when it comes to ice, ice is very much a low energy molecule. The less movement these molecules have, the more likely they are to stick together. This helps them conserve the energy that they do have, and they form these solid structures. All of the water molecules are stuck together in a very set pattern. I can pick this up, I can shake it, and you see at the end of the day, it's still got the same structure. Same with an ice cube. You can pick up an ice cube, you can shake it. The water molecules are going to stay in the same place. Well, what happens when I start putting in a little more energy? So I put in energy, that's actually gonna break these water molecules apart. And now that they're apart, you can still see, they're still in the same place together with each other. However, this time if I pick it up and shake it, now they're moving around each other. While they, they're staying in the same place, they now have the ability to move around each other. They're not necessarily connected with one another. So of course, the next question is, well, what happens if I crank in even more energy? Well, let's see. <clears throat> so why did me shaking it put in more energy? Well, we said that heat is just the energy of movement. So by getting these to move even more, we saw that atoms, molecules, started flying out of our container. And that is what the gas phase is. So when you have a liquid and you heat it up, it turns into gas. That is to say the molecules are moving so fast they escape from the liquid. And you can see here a little bit this steam coming up. Now a lot of people think steam is just hot air. Not true. Steam is actually water molecules becoming a gas and escaping up and out. Now eventually, of course, this water, it'll condense back to liquid water because there's not huge amounts of energy in the air, but for the time being, it can be a gas, a liquid, which is also in here, or a solid all in one place. And this is because of the interaction between heat and bond energy. That concludes our le lecture for today. I hope you learned something. If you have any questions, please feel free to post to the Blackboard or email uh, your professor, Amanda Salaya, or myself, Christopher Potts. Um, the information will be on the website. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.